with some geography. We got Lake Nyos. How can a lake kill 1,700 people? Well, though it sounds too insane to be true, it did indeed happen. Located in West Africa, the lake itself is deceptively beautiful. However, on August 21st, 1986, a mysterious cloud burst from the lake. It flooded towards the village and suffocated 1,700 people and animals. Nothing survived the event. The reason this happened is because beneath the water, there is a pocket of magma that leaks carbon dioxide into the lake. The CO2 stays dissolved in the water due to the pressure of the 650 feet of water on top of the magma secretions. Crazy, so kind of like a pop bottle with an invisible lid. Until one day, that lid popped. On that day, the lake abruptly depressurized and the CO2 exploded into the air, causing the devastating event. Today, pipes are used to siphon the CO2 out from the bottom of the lake in order to prevent this from happening again. But imagine when it did happen, it must have felt like some kind of magical grim occurrence. For, for sure. Number nine, the Salem Witch Trials. If you follow me on MA, you just know how much I hate the Salem Witch Trials. I hate them so much, okay? It's an event in history that is so inconceivably stupid, it's hard to believe it actually happened. The Salem Witch Trials occurred in Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693, where more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft and 20 were put to death. It all started because the daughter of Reverend Paris, Elizabeth, who was nine, and his niece, Abigail Williams, same age, started having fits. Another girl, Anne Putnam, age 11, started having them as well. The supernatural was blamed and soon the girls began accusing everyone they could, mostly people the town didn't like. Basically, if you confessed and you wanted to be saved, then you weren't executed, but if you were accused and didn't confess, you were killed. The paranoia was so bad that once you were accused, you couldn't escape this guilt they put on you. It was insane. But after the paranoia finally subsided, the colony admitted that they probably made a mistake and compensated the families. Like, yeah, oops, might have gotten a little carried away there. Wow, Whew. I got excited, sorry guys. Here's some money. The Salem Witch Trials today represent what happens when paranoia rules a courtroom and the whole thing still beguiles the world even 300 years later. Number eight, Unsinkable Sam. On a happier note, this is the kind of story that makes people believe that cats have nine lives. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. His tale begins aboard a German warship called the Bismarck. Among the 2200 soldiers was a black and white cat that somehow snuck aboard. One day, the Bismarck was decimated during an attack, and while the HMS Cossack was looking for survivors, they saw Oscar the Cat, name of the time, seeking refuge on a plank, like Jack from the Titanic. They hauled him aboard, but then several months later, the Cossack would be decimated. That's shipwreck number two. This time, it was the HMS Arc Royale who spotted him, and was then dubbed the name Unsinkable Sam. And then, shipwreck number three. Months later, as you can guess, the Royale was torpedoed. And once again, Sam was saved by the HMS Legion of the British Royal Fleet. Finally, this seafaring feline retired to land and later died in 1955. Number seven, Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly is a woman right out of a Jules Verne novel. In fact, you would think so if she hadn't met the man himself. In 1889, Nellie Bly took on a record-breaking voyage by traveling around the world in just 72 days. Her means of travel included a train, a steamship, a rickshaw, horse, and donkey. Her goal was to beat the fictional record set by Verne's hero, Phileas Fogg, in his 80-day odyssey. An event like this already appeared as a myth to the men of the time. Her editor at the New York World nearly refused to send her because her gender would make the trip impossible. No one but a man could do this, he told her. Very well, she replied. Start the man and I'll start the same day for some other newspaper and beat him. He backed down and eventually Nellie was on her way, turning fiction into reality. Number six, the Black Museum. No, I'm not talking about the Black Museum episode of Black Mirror, but honestly, not too far off. People have done some pretty vicious things to their enemies. There's a long list, but imagine turning your enemies into a permanent dinner guest because that's exactly what Ferdinand I of Naples actually did. Though everyone thought he was going to be a great king, he actually ended up being pretty psychotic. He would invite his enemies over for dinner, and while they gorged on pheasant, he would 
take them out, either the old fashioned way or literally throw them out of a window. He would then retrieve and dress the bodies and stage them. He called it his black museum and would invite new acquaintances to view it so they would know exactly who they were dealing with. So not to mess with him. What a psycho. Number five, Sir Adrian Cotton DeWalt. Love that name. There are gonna be a couple unbelievable events on this list from World War II, so just a heads up. But truth be told, the war itself is kind of hard to believe. Sir Adrian Cotton de Wart was not only a man who survived the impossible once, but he made a career out of it. He wasn't like your black adder general in the back with a pipe. This dude was on the front lines tossing grenades with one arm because he already lost the other. He served in the Boer War, World War I, and World War II. He survived being shot in the face, skull, hip, leg, ankle, and ear. One eye and one arm short, this enthusiastic war hero dove into the bloodshed again and again. He was seen pulling pins out of grenades and throwing them with his one good arm during Battle of the Somme. But even as a 60 year old man, he was still a beast. His plane got shot down in April 1941. He crashed it into the Mediterranean, survived, swam all the way to shore. Then he got captured by Italian soldiers, thrown into a POW camp. Then he escaped, eluded capture for eight days, but unfortunately the lack of Italian looks gave him away. He was released two years later and Churchill was such a big fan of him, he made him his rep over in China. He ended up passing away peacefully at age 83 despite hundreds of close calls with death. Number four, Simo Heha. This is actually kind of a plug for a short film I'm looking to raise funds for. Check out my Instagram to learn more. But his story is incredible and it's so unbelievable. Simo Heha's story sounds like something straight out of a movie, except it actually happened. A humble Finnish farmer who became the Soviet's nightmare in World War II. He is widely regarded as one of the most accomplished and skilled snipers in history. The Winter War began in Finland in 1939 after Russia decided that it was time to regain some territory. They thought it was going to be easy. But soon they came to fear the man who would be known as the White Death. He was trained as a sniper at a young age, didn't want to take human lives though, so he just became a farmer, but the lives of his countrymen were at stake. The Winter War lasted just over 100 days and within that time, Simo hit as many as 500 men, his personal best being 40 confirmed hits in one day. Some people estimate that it was over 800 people. In March 1940, he was hit in the jaw by a counter sniper, leaving him in a coma for 11 days. But when he awoke, however, the Russians surrendered. That is poetic justice. Number three, Alexander the Great. How did this guy exist? Was he the son of Zeus? The case is so convincing that even Alexander believed it himself. During the 15 years of his conquest, starting from his first victory when he was 18, Alexander never lost a battle. He was so prolific in battle that his strategies are still studied to this day. Before Alexander entered Egypt, they had been under Persian rule for just over 200 years. Through his incredible prowess and lightning quick decision making, Alexander defeated them. Egypt was so happy they even claimed him as their pharaoh. While he was in Egypt, however, Alexander decided to make the long trek to visit the shrine of Zeus Ammon. According to the man himself, he was guided there by ravens and it even rained during his journey which was interpreted as a blessing. When he got there, the priest named him a son of Zeus. Now if that doesn't make this guy sound like a myth, then I I don't know what will. Number two, Bodicea. Bodicea is the Morrigan in my mind. She is Xena, warrior princess. This woman was so ferocious, she was called the scourge of the Roman Empire. Yeah, that's right, this queen took on the Roman Empire. At the time Rome was invading the south of Britain, Queen Bodicea ruled the Inseni tribe of East Anglia along her husband, King Prasutagus. Though her early days remain mostly a mystery, she remains among the canon of heroes who defended the British Isles. She was fearsome to behold, with flaming red hair and a gaze so sharp it could cut glass. She and her husband fought against the Romans until his death, after which the Romans drove straight to take her on. They attacked her daughters publicly, which like mother bear, not a good idea, after which she toured in a chariot rallying the people in rebellion. She sat three Roman cities and took no prisoners. She annihilated the 9th legion when she took out their entire relief force. Sadly though, Bodicea fell after a vicious battle, but her name echoes in the halls of heroes. And last but not least, Richard, Saladin, and the Third Crusade. Just the Crusades in general are just unbelievable. Never in history have two rulers been so equally matched. 
Currently I'm reading Warriors of God, Richard the Lionheart and Saladin and the Third Crusade by James Rustin. And the fact that everything I've read so far like isn't just the next Game of Thrones novel astounds me. These two never met because Saladin believed that kings should not go to war if they had met, but because they were fighting over the Holy Land, war was kind of inevitable. But while Saladin did not engage in warfare, Richard dove right in the middle of everything. They both had such incredible admiration for each other that in the middle of battles, they would send each other gifts. Like, I don't understand. You killed my men. You killed my men. Here's a fruit basket. Literally happened. And another example, during the Battle of Jaffa, Richard's horse ended up being killed and Saladin was so impressed with him that he sent him two new ones. Two! On top of that, Richard had taken off half of his armor before he had left ashore to fight. So he was like, basically like, half naked. Huh. Eventually Saladin tried to have him assassinated, but Richard was so ferocious in battle that everyone feared him. The dude was pretty much a human bulldozer. The two assassins ended up waking up the camp because they were fighting about who should take the guy out. Kicking off the list at number 10, the golden toad. Scientists usually use frogs as a diagnostic for how things are going to go on our planet. And the answer is not good. Usually it's not good. Especially not for the froggy woggies. Amphibians breathe through their skin, which I gotta say, one, gross, but it makes them extra sensitive to changes in their environment. The golden toad extinction event happened pretty recently and very quickly. In their native home of Costa Rica, it was considered a good omen, or lucky if you saw it, but then sightings of this shiny dude became less and less, and then poof! 1987, these tiny little guys started to disappear one by one. Like the dreams we had as kids, almost, some would say. The local population was ill at ease and they had good reason to be. Alongside the golden toad, nearly half of all frogs and toads also started dying within a 30 kilometer range. And even stranger is that the area was free from human intervention, which led scientists to conclude that the cause was related to, you guessed it, climate change. As the temperatures rose, the frogs became more susceptible to the chytrid fungus, which decimated frog populations worldwide. And in 1989, the golden toad was the first species to become extinct as a direct result of climate change. Sad stuff. Rachel recommends reading The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Kohlberg because, well, it's a good one, so check it out yourselves. Number nine, the Pina Island tortoise. When the Mayans said the world was going to end in 2012, they may have just been onto something. We lost the last Pina giant tortoise back in 2012 and his name was Lonesome George. His name was Lonesome George. I'm gonna be the first to cry on this. And for decades before his passing, scientists were trying to get him to mate with females of a similar subspecies, but he just wasn't feeling it. To be fair, look at him. The guy looks exhausted. He looks like he needs three coffees before swiping right on mating apps. <laughs> oh, Lonesome George and his wrinkly necked friends. <laughs> this is sad, Taylor. Lonesome George and his wrinkly necked friends weighed in at about 400 pounds growing up to six feet long. Again, this extinction comes back to us humans with the use of tortoises as an onboard food in the 19th century and the goat population of Pinta Island growing rapidly during the 60s and 70s. These tortoises ran out of food. Number eight, the Labrador duck. I love ducks. You might as well play Goose Goose Duck because sadly, the Labrador duck is no more. But even before it went extinct, the Labrador duck was always rare and it served that way. Also referred to as the pie duck or the skunk duck due to its coloring, not its smell, not much is known about its behavior and habitat, but we do know that it liked to hang out in sheltered bays, sandbars, harbors in New Jersey, Long Island, New England, and of course, coastal Labrador, Northern Quebec. Did it have a New York accent? <laughs> Did it have a New York accent or a Canadian one? We just can't be sure. We've been looking, but honestly, we don't know at this point. The Labrador duck went extinct in the 1870s, but the direct cause is still unknown. Was it eaten to death? We don't know. The bird was known to taste bad, but it was pretty cheap for meat at the market, so that could be one possibility. But the ducks were actually hunted for their feathers more than their meat and their eggs were harvested as well. Another reason is that they were often in competition with us over their main food source, which were, as you would have guessed, Moloch's. Human interaction obviously played a massive role in its ducktails, especially considering the last known specimen was shot in New York. Shot in New York. Not a movie, assassinated in New York. Did they realize what was happening around the time? Probably, yeah, realistically probably. But it just goes to show how much the level of care has differed over the last century in relation to extinction. 
Number seven, the great auk. Its name makes you think this thing is the size of a moose or it's some type of ox, when in fact it's really just a cute flightless seabird was, rather. Once belonging in colonies off North Atlantic coast, the great auk would grow up to 30 inches long and its tiny wings would only be used to swim. Water wings. They were much smaller than 13 centimeters long. Little penguin flappy arm, no wonder they couldn't fly. They were cute, but quite defenseless. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting, and it just happened to be where most of these great auks were hanging out. Newfoundland looked like the iceberg in Club Penguin, so quite a few of them bit the bullet. By the 1950s, the last two known specimens were hunted by a fisherman on Elby Island, just off the coast of Iceland. So if you need to pay your respects, that's where you need to head. Number six, the stellar sea cow. Just like bumblebees are the whales of the insect world, they were the cows of the sea. <clears throat> okay, I know, I think I know about these cows. Hailing from the same order as the manatee, the stellar sea cow was a stellar sea animal until the very end, but they may return one day. Fingers crossed, more on that in a second. The stellar sea cow was named after George Wilhelm Steller, who discovered this massive blubbery creature in 1741 during the Vitus Bearings Great Northern Expedition after the crew became shipwrecked. Adults would have weighed about 9,000 kilograms and could reach lengths past 11 meters. That's a whole lot of cow. Despite surviving since the Pleistocene epoch over 2.6 million 11,000 years ago, there were no match for humans. They only swam at a meter deep and communicated via huffs and sighs to their family and lifelong partners, as I do normally. Are you hungry? <sighs> kind of. George Steller commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which made it incredibly easy to hunt them. Okay, that's really depressing. Leave it to humans to exploit love in order to kill. Classic Bruce Willis stuff. Considering the one year gestation period, the species just couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with the hunting, so they just died. But they may return. Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which can mean we could see these creatures again one day. Number five, the smooth hand fish. Not to be confused with cool hand Luke. The smooth hand fish was the first time in modern history where a marine type fish has gone extinct. This fish was a shallow water bottom dweller and I personally love him because he looks like one of the Bowser's minions. He looks moody. He has a fin that protrudes out of his face. Out of his face. Just 200 years ago, you would have seen these smooth dudes in the land down under. It lived in Australia, in Tasmania's warm waters and what made this fish so unique as its name hints towards is its hands. The smooth hand fish would seemingly walk along the ocean floor using its fins <laughs> as hands. The smooth hand fish would seemingly walk along the ocean floor using its fins as hands. So an angry looking fish with hands and a horn would walk towards you? Hard pass. Graham Edgar, marine ecologist at the University of Tasmania, shed some light on its habits, explaining that these fish were homebodies. They didn't have a large habitat. Oh, they just had like all the hands for the house. They spent most of their time sitting in the seabed with an occasional flap for a few meters if they're disturbed. At that point, they would just walk with their hands away from the drama. That's how I want to walk away from drama from now on. Like somebody brings it up to me and I'm just like, <laughs> Number four, Permian Triassic, AKA the Great Dying. Okay, what a nickname, love it. And one of the most mysterious extinction events on this list. Let's talk about it. The Permian Triassic extinction event destroyed the vast majority of life on Earth over 250 million years ago. Life was booming and then silence. Scientists have been boggled and bamboozled for years, but these pieces may finally be coming together. This event is not to be confused with the death of the dinosaurs. That's a different thing, which is still not as sad as the film The Land Before Time. No, this was an event so great that trees, plants, lizards, proto-mammals, insects, fish, mollusks, again, always mollusks, and then microbes didn't see coming. No one saw this coming at all. Nine out of 10 marine species, seven out of 10 land species just entirely vanished. Scientists discovered this event by evaluating fossils and sedimentary rock. While all the previous layers were teeming with life, there was a brief period where it all vanished, like a hamburger without toppings or tartar sauce. God in 60 seconds, just a smooth burger, nothing's getting in the way of that. No tartar sauce dripping down your shirt, absolutely. That's how fast it went. There are two explanations in the running. One was that it was due to a massive volcanic event, and two, of course, an asteroid. But so far there have been no traces of either. One hint is the massive anomaly in Wilkes Land, Antarctica. NASA spotted gravitational changes, which indicate an object of immense size sitting in a 300 mile wide crater. A massive object over 151 miles across and dives about 2,700 feet deep beneath the ice could be the massive rock that reset the world 250 million years ago. Or, I know what you're thinking, could also be aliens. 
We're 50-50 here, we're trying to figure it out. Number three, passenger pigeons. Commonly confused with the morning dove, the passenger pigeon once ruled the skies over Canada as recently as the 19th century. They're quite similar to the pigeons we see today, only instead of being aggressive and covered in mustard, they were quite graceful. Billions of these orange, orange, orange beauties painted the skies and rumor has it they would fly in flocks so large it would block the sun out for a couple hours. Flocks that block. But only a few decades passed and the passenger pigeons are no more. What happened? The very last passenger pigeon was Martha. Oh, Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914, so we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to their extinction. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated arguably the coolest looking bird out there. Number two, the sixth extinction. Remember the book Rachel told me to mention? Well, here it is again, it's that good. Here's a big question no one is ready for. Are we part of the sixth extinction? Is it happening right now? In the past, asteroids and ice ages have all caused massive extinction events, but after human beings invented the wheel and discovered fire, things started to change. In the 1800s, industrialization drove up extinction rates and continues to do so. Based on this list alone, we know how much human beings have played a role in extinction events of the past. Have we created one that we can't stop? According to Elizabeth Kohlberg, across the world, scientists are monitoring what could be the largest extinction event since the dinosaurs. That's right, the way human beings interact with the environment and affect biodiversity could be more deadly than an asteroid hitting the Earth. Come on, we gotta wake up. With an ever-climbing list of endangered species, Kohlberg and the world asks this question. Could this be mankind's lasting legacy, and is it too late to change it? And next up we have the Dunkleosis. Now it may sound silly because it has the word dunk in it, <laughs> but this ancient fish did not shoot threes. It actually shot its head at you into self-defense at 50 milliseconds a jab. The Dunkleosis was a 34 foot long armored fish that came from the Devonian era. Its fossil was first discovered in 1867 by Dr. David Dunkel. He of course named it after himself in Dunkel fashion. It swam confidently in subtropical waters and weighing around one ton, which is 2,000 pounds, the dunk was kind of a bully, but it's not his fault. He was born this way. Its massive skull was well equipped with two fangs and these razor sharp teeth would rub against each other as they grew. So if the dunk's big rock head wasn't intimidating enough, he's also sharpening his mouth 24 seven. As for diet, the dunk would use those fangs on anything that crossed its path during their coral commute. They would eat fish, sharks, and dare I say, other dunk leo style. Cannibal fang fish for the win. Luckily these guys aren't around anymore. They all went extinct around 360 million years ago during the Devonian extinction. For a scary look fish, it has a rather sweet name. Shout out to David Dunkel. Thanks for all your hard work.